and welcome to Loudoun County Public Library's Female Leadership Speaker Series. March is Women's History Month. In this spring, we are proud to present a series to celebrate the achievements of local women in leadership positions. My name is Susanne Engelhardt and I work at Sterling Library. Today, I'm delighted to welcome the sixth president of Northern Virginia Community College, Dr. Ann Kress. Welcome, Dr. Kress, and thank you for sitting down with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Let me just say a few words about Northern Virginia Community College and you, Dr. Kress, before we start our conversation. For almost 60 years, Northern Virginia Community College, NVCC, or more commonly, even though informally known as NOVA, has provided educational opportunities to individuals in our community. Today, it offers more than 160 degrees at the associate's level and certificate programs to prepare students for a globally competitive workforce. Spread out over six campuses, Alexandria, Annandale, Manassas, Springfield, Woodbridge, and Loudoun, right here in Sterling, Northern Virginia Community College is the third largest multi-campus community college in the United States and largest educational institution in the Commonwealth of Virginia. NOVA's FIDA program guarantees admission to a long list of four-year co colleges in and beyond the region, and the school also offers other programs, including dual enrollment for high school students. Dr. N. Kress has been the president of Northern Virginia Community College since January 2020. She brings almost 30 years of experience in higher education to the region and holds degrees in English, finance, and higher education administration. Student access and success, global education, technology, and workforce development are topics she is especially interested in. She serves on numerous national and regional boards, commissions, and councils to advocate for continuing education, community colleges, and most of all, students and their needs. Today, she's here to talk about leadership and share her experience and advice with us. Dr. Press, it is a pleasure to have you as a guest today. Oh, well, again, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And also, thank you for this series. This is a really great idea. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, it's very interesting to hear from local leaders and uh, hear what they have to say, uh, share some advice and inspire everybody in the community. So we are glad to have you here. All right, so I already alluded to this in my introduction, <laughs> uh, access to education and economic opportunity and building innovative industry and community partnerships are areas you focus on as president of NOVA. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about one or two projects that you are especially proud of since you began your tenure? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, I've only been here for a little bit more than a year and NOVA's incredible success in providing access to high quality education and workforce development programs long predates me. Um, so I was really delighted to come to NOVA and help build on the success that we already had. So a couple programs that I might highlight, um, one of which even during the pandemic, we were able to continue growing um, are these employer partnerships. Um, so when we look at the opportunities that students might have through apprenticeship programs, for example, and I don't know if folks listening would know that NOVA really did um, pioneer the IT apprenticeship program with Amazon and cloud computing. But even during the pandemic, we were able to keep many of those apprenticeships going virtually, especially in the tech space. So I think that's one of the things that I'm definitely proud of about NOVA is that those industry partnerships have continued and even strengthened. Even the um, conversation we're having here today really does rely on technology and cloud computing and data centers. And certainly there is a growing um, data center presence all around Loudoun. And so we are delighted that we're strengthening our partnership with the data center operators. We've got a great data center program at the Loudoun campus, and we wanna continue to grow that as well. And then when you look on the other side, I think one of the programs we were able to start during the pandemic that really speaks to an extension of the high school dual enrollment program is our summer jump start. So last summer, and again this summer, we offered up to two free college courses to graduating seniors to provide them with that opportunity to avoid summer learning loss, to avoid that summer melt. I know it's been a disrupted year for juniors and seniors. Um, so we really wanna keep them on that college going path. And so we were able to serve close to 2,600 um, students last summer. And this summer we look to expand that program. 
Well, it's a fantastic program um, and gives people the opportunity, especially if they might be kind of on the fence whether or not they should pursue it. And mm -hmm. by uh, having that opportunity, uh, not miss out on any time or, like you say, uh, forget some of the learning that they right. already have. You already mentioned um, the partnerships with uh, um, community businesses, the data centers here in Loudoun County. I think yesterday was actually the day of the data centers. It was, this. it was. Uh, so um, I think, um, what is it, uh, G3 in the fast forward, mm -hmm. especially uh, programs that um, are supposed to kind of push technology and accelerate um, um, careers in mm -hmm. in the technology uh, field. So definitely something necessary in these days, more so than even before, it seems. Absolutely. And I think one of the great things about NOVA is that students can come in and really find any pathway that they're looking for. If they want to transfer on, they could absolutely do that. And they can move on to Mason, to UVA, to William & Mary. They can move to any college or university that they want to. But we see an increasing number of students who are really interested in career pathways. And so the G3 program, which stands for Get Skilled, Get a Job, Give Back, is really a workforce college promise program that provides students with this opportunity to attend a career pathway program at NOVA with a tuition scholarship from the state of Virginia to help grow the state's workforce. Um, REV, which stands for Reemploying Virginians, is another version of that, and it is for individuals who are dislocated workers. So I think especially when we look at the economy post-pandemic, we see that so many of these jobs will require some sort of technology background or some other employable skill, whether it's in healthcare or the trades. So anyone could really come to NOVA and find that pathway, and it is more affordable than ever before. Yes, and especially taking into account that unemployment has risen during the pandemic, this is definitely something that hopefully a couple of viewers today will start thinking about and uh, potentially pursuing. Yeah. Okay, my light is <laughs> cutting out. I think it's going to come back here soon. Um, anyhow, uh, let's talk about college affordability. Mm -hmm. So that has been another key issue of your work even before you became president of NOVA. Mm -hmm. For example, as a member of the Higher Education Committee of 50, you mm -hmm. helped to articulate and uh, make recommendations um, regarding the full cost of college for a changing student demographic. Mm -hmm. So what challenges do local students experience and how has your work on the committee shaped the college's response to their situation? Sure, absolutely. One of the things that I, I hope everybody who listens to this um, is aware of the free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA. And one of the things that the Higher Education Committee of 50 really focused on was the FAFSA, making sure that more and more students could be able to complete it. I think if there's a concern that all of us in higher education have right now, it's that the rate of um, graduating seniors completing the FAFSA has really fallen off during the pandemic. And it's particularly fallen off for students in low income brackets, which is ironic because they are the students who would benefit most um, from federal student aid. They would receive full Pell grants. They would qualify for state grants in the state of Virginia. The FAFSA I always tell students is sort of the golden ticket. Once you've completed that, it is really what opens the door to so many forms of aid. So I think some of my work on the Higher Education Committee of 50 is has led to a decision that won't unfortunately impact students this year, but next year in simplifying the FAFSA. But right now, NOVA and many colleges and universities offer assistance in completing that document. That is the key to college affordability because it opens the door to every sort of aid, including G3 dollars. Um, so that's one thing I would put out there. I'd also mentioned that the Virginia College Access Network, and you can Google that, Virginia College Access Network, um, has offered uh, through this year one-on-one -on -one free assistance to families in filling out the FAFSA. And that's all available virtually online, so please take advantage of that. Um, the other thing I would just really quickly mention is that NOVA has been um, a beneficiary 
of the multiple federal stimulus funds. So we have dollars in emergency aid and other kinds of aid to give to students today that we didn't have in the past. So individuals who might um, have seen a change in their family situation, whereas before they thought, oh, college is gonna be easily affordable and now they're looking at something very different. I would really strongly encourage them to reach out to Nova or to their local college or university and ask about emergency aid that came through the stimulus funds because it is there and colleges are very eager to make sure that students have the support that they need, whether those dollars have to go to buy a new computer, to buy a book, to pay for a class, that assistance is available. Very important uh, also to know that it's not just for tuition itself, but also for books and everything else that might uh, might might not be uh, as easily uh, mm -hmm. financed when you're actually thinking about um, continuing your education. And it is one mm -hmm. of the biggest hurdles, uh, the finances. So it's very important that uh, you share it with us uh, what uh, options there are. I think this is also something that is very near and dear to your heart. I think you are a first generation student yourself. I am. Had to work uh, through through years uh, of being a student with jobs on the side and loans and everything. So you know absolutely where a lot of people are. Yeah, absolutely. No, I am the first in my family to go to college. My sister followed. There's only two of us. Um, my mother finished high school. Her mother did not. Um, my father's parents. Um, my grandfather finished high school. My grandmother finished sixth grade. Um, and my father got a drafting certificate at night um, in a, a technical school. And so when it came time for his daughters to think about their futures, he was very excited that we would be able to achieve this college dream. And I think that's exactly what excites me about my work is that you know, community colleges are were created by President Truman really in the 1940s as democracies colleges, right? Really providing that access to higher education to so many people who never had it before. And this is exactly the same role we play today. Again, students can start at NOVA and transfer on. Um, I was talking to some students the other day who are transferring on to Georgetown. Um, that is not a college that they would have imagined themselves going to just two short years ago. So I think you know anyone who's thinking about where to start their college education, that notion of affordability and accessibility, but also high quality is all important. And you will find that at NOVA and at community colleges across the country. Absolutely, yeah, there's uh, a lot lot to be discovered at NOVA, for sure. Um, the college has a long history of offering distance learning courses. So uh, with the emergence of COVID-19, of course, colleges had to respond uh, quickly and pivot to online learning. So how did NOVA handle this challenge and uh, how has it affected uh, student support at the college? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a great question. And so folks who are listening to this may not realize this. It's one of the best kept secrets, I think, in the state of Virginia, that NOVA is actually the backbone for the distance learning programs at 19 of 23 community colleges across the state. So if you're at a community college in the southern part of the state, you might be taking an online course that says your college, that looks like it's your college, but it's actually taught by NOVA. So we had a very strong infrastructure to flip our classes to remote. Um, even prior to the pandemic, about 12,000 students a year took their coursework online through NOVA. So we were able to do that with incredible work by our faculty and their dedication and innovation just was remarkable, as well as our staff who really did flip all of our student services virtual. So we set up virtual lobbies so that students could come in with concerns. We added remote student support specialists so that if a student went missing from a class and a faculty member was concerned, someone would reach out and find out what was going on. How could we help? We provided uh, loaner laptops. We turned our parking lots into Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so we did all we could to help our students sustain and it worked. Um, we saw a higher enrollment in fall than we had in many falls, which was really counter to enrollment trends across the country. And we also saw that our students succeeded. Um, when we looked at the impact on their grades, we actually saw a much um, or a double the increase in A's, then we saw an increase in um, lower grades. So our students are amazing. Their tenacity, their resiliency, their perseverance, they have gone through this pandemic with us and we have been there to support them. 
Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. And of course, it's important because it's not just flipping the classes themselves, but really having that support network, like you say, if that's mm -hmm. uh, tutoring or talking about financial aid or mm -hmm. just kind of being there, very important. Um, especially since so many things kind of get lost since yeah. uh, we just interact virtually now. Right. Uh, do you think higher education will ultimately continue to shift to online learning, or do you think we're going to go back to uh, primarily face-to-face -face once once we can? It's interesting when we talk to our students, and I should say that I, I meet with our students monthly in a virtual format in large groups and small groups. What I hear from them is this has taught them that they want more choices. Right, that students would love to have face to face instruction, but also the option to learn remotely um, and they would like all of those options available to them, which makes sense. I mean, I think our students live very variable lives. You know, their children may be sick one day and they need to stay home. And um, is there a reason they should miss out on classes now that we have this virtual environment or a student might be at the Loudoun campus, for example, and want to take a course that's typically only offered at the Alexandria campus. And, in the um, in the pre pandemic times, that was not an, a distance that was easily traveled, even if you did have a car. Um, so what we've seen with remote instruction is that students have the entire curriculum open to them and a, a student at Loudoun can take a class that would typically be at Alexandria or at Manassas. And so we want to provide that option to our students going forward. So. Even when we come back to campus this fall for the majority of our courses, you'll still see a very robust online set of offerings. And then the last thing I'll mention is we have heard pretty consistently from our students that they love virtual services. So they don't really want to have to drive again 45 minutes to campus for a 15 minute meeting. Um, they would much prefer to log on from their homes or from their work or from wherever. And so you'll see us really maintain a very strong set of virtual services so that our students um, can log on and get that tutoring, library assistance, financial aid assistance, whenever and wherever they need it. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, there are actually some advantages that we didn't mm -hmm. really uh, expect uh, beforehand. So yeah, uh, great. Thank you for talking about that. Um, Emerging industries uh, rely heavily on uh, STEM skills. So STEM, mm -hmm. of course, stands for um, science, technology, math, and um, engineering. Not in mm -hmm. that order, but they're all in there. <laughs> NOVA has a special program to inspire and prepare students, uh, actually of all ages, for the workforce of the future. Can you tell us a little bit more about this systemic program and yep. uh, how it's fostering uh, future, even female leaders? Mm -hmm. Yep, so STEM is right in the middle of systemic and systemic is a great partnership that Nova has actually with one of our corporate partners and that's Micron Technologies that really saw as it grew within our region, the need to expand its own workforce. So. Um, that doesn't start, by the way, when somebody starts college, right? If, if the first time you're considering a career in STEM is in your first year of college, you might be a little behind. And so Systemic has its, its mission to really reach down into those middle school and high school grades to help students understand what the full diversity of STEM is. Um, that, you know, when someone says it's engineering, often they don't know what engineering really is or that there are multiple kinds of engineering. Engineering. Do you want to be a civil engineer? Do you want to be a material sciences engineer? Um, so systemic takes this sort of robust programming and science enrichment down to the middle schoolers and typically um, pre pandemic, they would have come to the systemic lab. They would have um, played around in our fab lab. They would have created things. They would have seen um, our students at work in mechatronics and understand what that is or attended um, a briefing on cybersecurity and and seen that exciting world. We couldn't do that right over the past year. So systemic went virtual and they've been offering virtual workshops for students and for teachers. And I think that's also really important. We really want to engage middle and high school teachers um, to encourage them to encourage students to go through this pathway. But to your point, one of the things that our folks in the Fab Lab and Systemic have identified is that they see a lot more young women interested in the sciences in middle school than they do by the time they hit high school. And so that again stresses, I think, to all of us that we need to make sure that students 
um, young women, um, students of every race and ethnicity understand that these are pathways for them. And that quite frankly, this is where the future is. And so there is a home for you in STEM, um, regardless of what your interest is. Um, there, we even have kits, for example, for young women where they can see that, um, that there are uh, fabric technologies, right? That the, the realm of technology goes far beyond the computer in front of you and that there are technologies being built into everything. There are food technologies, right? There are medical device technologies, things that young people may not have ever thought of before. That's what we do through Systemic. That sounds like a fantastic program and I hope that uh, maybe a couple of people who hadn't heard about this before are now aware of it because I thought this is really something that uh, needs to be put out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And especially, I should mention, during the pandemic, we've made many of these workshops available to parents who might be homeschooling their children um, or just to community members. Um, we even, for example, uh, leading up to Thanksgiving, we had a whole session where people could program and fabricate pie toppers. Um, so just to see, you know, what does it mean to write code that can actually create a 3D object? Yeah, yeah, something that's very popular. We, mm -hmm. of course, here at Loudoun County Public Library also have some maker spaces. Mm -hmm. but, uh, just like you said, you know, right now the face to face is just not possible. So we're hoping to bring those programs back as well because mm -hmm. they're very uh, popular and really necessary for the yeah. future as well. All right, it's been almost 60 years since uh, Northern Virginia Community College was founded. And uh, in that time, it grew from 600. Mm -hmm. 761 students in 1965 to around 77,000 right now. So what kind of challenges does it pose uh, to preside over the largest educational institution in the Commonwealth of Virginia? And how do you <laughs> overcome those challenges? I don't know if they're challenges. I always think of them as opportunities, but I had to laugh because I was talking to somebody the other day uh, who mentioned that they had gone to Nova when it was in a warehouse, you know, in one of those early classes. I think that's the history of community colleges. If folks don't know much about our sector as an institution, is that they really, so many of them sprang up overnight about 60 years ago um, with the growing demand for higher education in every community. And as a result, you know, my previous institution was started in what was a condemned high school. The college that a community college I worked at before that was started in an old abandoned hotel. Um, you know, Nova was in a warehouse. And so, you know, to think about those very humble beginnings yeah. where it was very much student centered and that's the reason we came into being. And now to look at a place like Nova is just remarkable. I don't think anyone who was sitting there 60 years ago would think, oh, this is what Nova's going to look like uh, 60 years from now. So I think the opportunities are that we are a very diverse institution, right? We at Nova, we're a minority serving institution. We have no majority student population. We are as diverse as the community that we serve, which is Northern Virginia. And um, our, our goal right now, especially coming out of the pandemic, is to make sure that no matter how a student accesses Nova, whether that student's on the Loudoun campus or on the Woodbridge campus or virtually, uh, that they have that consistent equitable access to the services that they need. And because we're such a large place, that can be a challenge, making sure that happens. Um, but I also think it's an incredible opportunity. I also think there's, um, there are opportunities for us to partner in ways that we never thought of before. In fact, one of my meetings earlier today was with the Capital Area Food Bank to talk about um, their focus, which is um, pivoting itself away from being uh, around food provision alone into talking about financial security and sustainability. Um, so I do think there are those partnerships that probably when community colleges were started, as academic institutions, no one thought, oh, in 60 years, we'll be partnering with area food banks, including in Loudoun, um, that we would be partnering with um, K-12 institutions and providing high school dual enrollment, uh, that we would be thinking about summer enrichment and STEM enrichment. Um, so I think that these are always opportunities on the horizon, and luckily, NOVA is well-placed to take advantage of them. Most definitely, yeah. <laughs> Um, what does a typical day at work look like for you? Lori said you had some meetings earlier. Oh, um, sure. 
It's, you know, every day is different. I do think that's one of the, um, I started, I should go back and say, I started in community colleges as an adjunct faculty member. I taught uh, writing in the English department and then eventually became a full-time faculty member in English and a department chair and took on various administrative roles. And um, so, you know, one of the things that I've discovered as I've, I've grown in community colleges and been president of one institution, now another, is that every day is different. Right, every day may be a series of meetings or discussions, or but every single time you pick up the phone, open an email, have a conversation, it is aligned with the mission of the institution, but it is something different. So there's a lot of variety in my day, and um, and they're long days. So my first meeting was early this morning. My last one will end around 8:30 this evening, and much of what I do is really advocate for NOFA and our students in the community um, at the state level, at the federal level. Um, just a couple of days ago, I recorded a session that was part of a Washington Post gathering on um, education and, and the post-pandemic economy because NOVA is part of um, the task force on higher education and opportunity, looking at how we can support our soon to be graduates and recent graduates and what is a very different economy than it was pre pandemic. And so there are all of these things that are in front of me and I couldn't be more proud to go into every single discussion, every single meeting, knowing that I represent such an incredible institution like Nova. That's beautiful that uh, you have that enthusiasm, of course, yeah. uh, it's very, very important in your position representing and of course uh, rallying uh, all the different stakeholders. Um, you already kind of talked a little bit about it. You've uh, actually had a lot of different roles in your long uh, career in the higher education uh, sector. Uh, has that shaped your view on leadership differently going through all those different positions, not just uh, on the ground in the classroom with uh, the students, but also in administrative roles? Oh, absolutely. I think. You know, one of the things that is, I think, incredibly valuable for any leader is to understand um, who they're leading, right? Um, it can be, you can be so caught up in your meetings and your emails and your calls that um, you can start to lose sight of why you're there. And so having been a faculty member, having, you know, had pretty much any role that you could have in an educational institution, I have a really good sense of the incredible value and important work that happens throughout our institution. Um, and then I also, you know, and I hope to in the next couple of years at NOVA, I also try to go back into the classroom periodically. So probably about a year ago, I taught an entry level writing class. And again, it gives you a firsthand um, view of the challenges and that our students are facing and that they're bringing to the classroom and that, you know, the first line of any institution is going to be its faculty and staff. And so what, how can we better support them and doing the work that they need to do? So I do think that's incredibly important and just listening, right? Um, recognizing that as a leader, you need to be humble about that, that, you know, at the end of the day, someone's going to point a finger at you and say, this didn't happen because of Anne, or this did happen because of Anne, and you don't necessarily want that credit, but you do have to take the blame. Um, but you come to that point far less frequently if you're actually listening to the people who are doing the work and listening to their ideas and letting um, their voices come through and shape the actions that you take. Yeah, very important uh, not to lose that touch with um, with the students. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, primary stakeholder, of course. Uh, I think you did town hall meetings with the student po population with several hundred students at the same time. So you're definitely also available and accessible to the students. And I think it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sounds like you have a very hands-on leadership style. Oh well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, you know, I think it's as much as is possible in such a large institution. Um, even before the pandemic, I was on every one of our campuses um, at least once a month, meeting with faculty and staff, meeting with our students. Now that we've gone virtual, I do that virtually every single month. I have a number of zooms um, by campus, and then also with students, and then with our student government leaders. And again, you listen and you hear, you know, maybe where the 
the pain points are for people. Um, we discovered uh, probably two Zooms ago with our students that the financial impact of COVID was really starting to hit them. Um, they had run through resources they had before, so we actually made a decision to increase the amount of emergency aid that we sent to our students because of the feedback that we got. And, and again, I, if, unless you're talking with people and listening, you just don't know that. And so I think that's incredibly critical. Yeah, and I think it's also very important to hear that that uh, students are heard, their concerns mm -hmm. are heard, because it's very important, especially in a big institution like mm -hmm. uh, NOVA. Um, how much more time do you have, Dr. Chris? Okay. Um, maybe like five, ten minutes. Okay, all right. Then, because um, uh, I know we are kind of um, combining some of my questions here already, but there are still some that I'm interested in hearing uh, from you about. So um, one specifically in my preparation for this conversation, I came across a story from your student days that you developed an alternate syllabus with all women authors for oh. your early American literature class. I Do you did. kind of remember what sparked that idea and what you learned from it? And I also imagine it probably influenced your teaching to a degree. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Oh, this is so funny. So, um, and he has since passed, but I had a prof an English professor for an American lit class in graduate school. And every single author on the syllabus was a male. I mean, these were classic American authors, so I'm not going to argue with the quality of their work, but I did walk up to him after class and I said, um, I, and I was much younger then and, and um, probably less cognizant of how to speak to people in authority than I became later on. And I just said, why are you making us read all these boy books? This is ridiculous. What year is this? It was probably the 90s. I said, this is, this is crazy. And so to his credit, I have to give him full credit. He looked at me and he said, if you don't like the syllabus, make up your own. He said, but you have to read all of my boy books. And I said, okay. He said, but I have to approve it. So I went through that whole process and I did, and I submitted it to him and he let me write all my papers on that. And he was, in, in fact, at a certain point, he started giving me books. And, but it, what it taught me was a number of things. And one is that when you see a situation, um, although probably now years later, I would have handled it a little differently. When you see a situation where you, you notice that something is excluded, you should raise your hand and say something. Um, and, and what he admitted later was that he had studied at a different time. He had earned his doctorate in a different time. And he straight up said at a certain point in conversation, I am not familiar with many of these authors. This is, but he also said to me, I am too old to learn anything new. Um, so, but I'm happy that you want to learn new things. And, and that, as I developed my own syllabi, as I taught, I just always wanted to make sure that all of the voices were included because, you know, I think back to what it felt like to be a young woman in this class and look at a list that had no women on it. Um, and it just felt when I knew I could think even with my limited knowledge of American lit, because I studied um, English literature, that I could think of authors. And I thought, this is just not fair. Um, so I do think when we talk often about equity and inclusion, um, it's helpful to remember times when you were excluded. And what did that feel like? And, and you know, what does it mean then to use that experience and your voice to be a good ally for others? That's of course something that's still happening. Uh, there's been a lot of progress in the last few decades, but uh, we still see that it is a big issue. Uh, another thing that you said um, that I find very interesting, um, women often have a problem maybe with speaking up specifically mm -hmm. because they are women. Do you have any advice on how women mm -hmm. can maybe become a little bit more confident or do you have any advice for uh, girls and uh, women to pursue their dreams? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think there's been so much work around um, what they even call silence sort of the cones where if you don't speak up early enough in a conversation or in a classroom, you never do. Um, just the notion that you would speak at that point, it's so late that you just put your thoughts aside. So I do think speaking early is important. You know, whether you're in a meeting and just introducing yourself or in a classroom, if you're um, a young woman, make your voice heard. 
Um, the other thing that I think women can do for each other is to amplify their voices. I'm sure many folks who might be listening to this have been in a situation where as a woman, they've made a point in a meeting or in a class and, and, you know, no one acknowledges it. And then the gentleman sitting next to them makes a very similar point and everyone says, you know, that's, that's a great idea. Um, you know, as women, we can amplify each other's points. And so I always been when I'm talking to women leaders, I say, you know, if Anne says something and you think that's a good idea, say, like Anne said, I agree, and then repeat it. And you know, that sense of amplification, it also builds your confidence and it, it makes sure that people know to listen. And, and that I think is one thing that we can do. And the other thing I would say is that the cost of not speaking is always higher than the cost of speaking. Um, you know, there's, there's very little that can go wrong if you just raise your voice and say something, um, just to put that thought out there so that people do hear you eventually. Um, and again, support, right? I, I really believe strongly that women support women. Um, and my, my daughter, uh, who's in her first year of college, has a little button that, say, that says, girls support girls. And, and I think that's the way we need to be. Yeah, that's a beautiful advice. And uh, yeah, um, supporting each other is very important, not just uh, trying to find your own voice and just jump in the cold water and practice, speak up mm -hmm. small steps first and then build more confidence. Okay, can I throw one more question in? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay, um, since this is a library program, I'm asking mm -hmm. all of our featured speakers about their reading habits or what they're reading right now, or if they have uh, a favorite book. So if you could share that with us, that would be wonderful. Sure. So I actually, I knew this question was coming. So I, as luck would have it, we had book club last night in my neighborhood. We sit outside socially distanced. And one um, of the, group suggested this book, so I'm going to hold it up so you can see it. Oh. It's a book, um, Betty Smith's Tomorrow Will Be Better. It's a novel from the 1940s that apparently went sort of fallow and then was rediscovered just last year. And this is the woman who wrote A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. And it is a story about a young woman, Margie, and her journey um, during you know, a time that probably fewer and fewer of us remember. Um, but I would recommend this book. Um, in terms of a favorite book, I, I have to say that one of my favorite books ever is The Great Gatsby. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. But I'm a big reader. I'm in the midst of a book, a nonfiction book about um, the TWA, um, the, what were called stewardesses at the time. It just came out. It's a history about the role that they played in ways that probably most of us don't understand during Vietnam and, and other occasions. And then I'm about to start um, Clara and the Sun, um, which is a new novel by Kazuo Ishiguro. So very wide. In yes, yes, yeah, well, it's, it's good. Yeah, I, I hope some people, you know, kind of seek out these books because they certainly sound intriguing. OK, looking at the time, I, I could talk to you for much longer, but uh, I'm sure you uh, well, I know you have some other business to attend to. Yeah. So um, I uh, really appreciate that you sat down with us. So thank you very much for being our guest today and uh, sharing your experience and your advice with the community. Uh, it was very interesting to uh, hear what one of the premier educational institutions uh, here in the region has done to deal with the pandemic uh, and uh, also what opportunities NOVA really kind of offers um, to everybody who is thinking about taking the next step uh, in the education. So thank you very much for your time, Dr. Chris. Oh, thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. And thanks so much to the Loudoun community. You've been such a great support for our Loudoun campus and our Provost Julie Leidig. So thank you for believing in NOVA. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye. So bye-bye. It has been an immense pleasure to talk with Dr. N. Kress, president of Northern Virginia Community College. Please join us next Thursday. April 1st um, at 12.30, when uh, you will be able to see my conversation with Jennifer King, the assistant running backs coach of the Washington football team. And then the week after, on April 8th, uh, we're going to sit down with Dr. Weidekamp of the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum. All of the interviews with the featured speakers will also become available on the Loudoun County Public Library's YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us today and I hope to see you next week.